Welcome to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham, run by Professor Yuja Nagazawa. We at Closer to Truth are thrilled to collaborate. Aaron Siegel is Senior Lecturer in Philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel. Aaron, let's begin by distinguishing the fact that your academic work is as an analytic philosopher of religion, and your religious position is as a rabbi in Judaism. We'll start with the analytic philosopher, but let us know whenever a view is founded on Jewish thought. Later, we'll also talk a little bit about Jewish philosophy per se. So, assuming there is a God who created the universe and all reality, what's the relationship between the creator and the creation, how to understand what the creation is. In what sense does the creation depend on God on a continuing basis? What are the options? Let's start by laying out the landscape of possible alternatives. Okay, yeah, so in order to lay out the landscape, I think it's important to appreciate there, there are really a few different questions, each of which uh, generates its own axis along which uh, views about this question of the dependence of creation on uh, the creator uh, can differ. So one qu question um, is was uh, basically, uh, I think, alluded to in the way you put it, um, sort of in what sense or what kind of dependence are we talking about when we say that the created universe depends on God? Um, and one uh, sort of, I think, traditional standard way of thinking about it is that it's, you know, uh, ordinary garden variety causation, just sort of writ large at a cosmic scale. So the, the same kind of uh, causation that you have um, when you know eating a hot dog causes heartburn. Um, it's just that in this, this case, God caused uh, the universe uh, to come into existence. And then there are a number of questions you might ask, assuming that conception, the standard causal conception. Questions like, how often is God causing things uh, to go on in the universe? Um, you know, is it all the time? Is it just once in a while? Was it just once at the very beginning? Um, and then there's a question of what is he causing uh, when he does so? So at the beginning, you know, he caused the universe to come into existence, uh, assuming that he's, uh, you know, uh, intervening or he's causing things more frequently than just that one time. You know, what's he doing? Is he is he creating the universe again every moment? Um, is he just you know, uh, uh, interfering here and there? Is he sustaining the universe? But all of these options are sort of options within that standard uh, causal conception. But you might suggest alternatively that the sort of dependence here is not just regular causation at all. Um, it's something more intimate or deeper, um, what I call deep dependence. Um, and it's easiest to get a handle on what sort of relation we, we have in mind um, using examples. So like, uh, you know, you have a, a ballet, a, a particular performance of a ballet, um, and you, you obviously have uh, uh, ballet dancers involved with well, a ballet, that particular one depends for its existence and its nature on what those ballet dancers are doing in a much more a deeper way, more intimate way. It's not just regular causation, right? I mean, the ballet, ballet dancers couldn't be doing what they're doing and the ballet be any different. There's a, a necessary connection there. Other examples that come to mind are, you know, a thing and its parts. A thing depends for its existence and the way it is, standardly thought, on uh, on its parts and, and their existence, or a thought um, and, and the thinker. So that that's a, a suggestion that some have made for understanding the relation of the whole creation on God. That it's not just regular causation, not even regular causation happening all the time, but something um, much deeper, okay? That's, so that's one question, which is that access, access. Another question is not what kind of dependence are we talking about here, but sort of how, how separate and apart are God and the created universe, the creator uh, and the creation? You know, this is somewhat sometimes put in terms of the jargon of uh, imminence and transcendence. How imminent is God? Is there overlap? Is, is, is there some sense in which the universe is constituted by God or made up of God, or are these non-overlapping things uh, separate and apart? Okay, and the, I think the standard theistic view, certainly the standard um, traditional Jewish view, I think is that uh, 
uh, you know, fundamentally, God and the universe uh, are uh, totally separate and apart. God doesn't overlap the universe. Anyway, he's no part of the universe. He created the universe, but uh, the, the two of them um, are uh, entirely distinct, entirely separate. Okay, um, and that's a, a view um, that I, I call true transcendence to oppose it to other views that place um, more of a, uh, an emphasis on imminence and give some room uh, for God to be imminent uh, in the universe. Okay, so those are two questions. Are these issues mo uh, mutually exclusive? Uh, deep dependence, the imminence that has been used and transcendent, that God is, is independent. Is, could there be some sense in which what seems to be uh, a completely opposed to each other in a logical sense is could there be some sense of logic where you can interact have them interact yes yeah, so that's an excellent question and i think even though i am attracted to this deep dependence and i'm also attracted uh to true transcendence at least initially and and on some grounds i do think there's a deep tension there between these two ideas that somehow god and the universe are wholly separate but on the other hand the universe depends in this much deeper way on God, right? I mean, if you think about the examples that I use to illustrate what this deep dependence is, like a ballet and the ballet dancers, they're, they're, they're not separate and apart at all. Uh, the ballet dancers and their activity constitutes, makes up the, uh, the particular ballet. And I think that's true of pretty much all the examples that we could think of. So I think there's a, a real tension uh, between those two as they stand. Okay. And An example that you gave that I liked is the is a wrinkle in a carpet. You you ah can, yeah. You can't have uh, the wrinkle w without some deep dependence on the carpet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The wrinkle depends in this uh, in this very deep way um, on the carpet and its properties, its configuration at the time. But that's another case in which, of course, they overlap in some in some very real sense. They're not separate and apart the way that traditional theists want to have. Uh, God and the uh, created universe. Now, as you go into a deep dependence, does that does that uh, kind of edge towards a pantheistic or a panentheistic, where where God is the universe but beyond the universe? It, 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 it is is that where you're heading? Okay, so uh, I mean, deep dependence all by itself, I don't think gets you there. It's only when you start thinking about its uh, relationship to this question of transcendence versus imminence. Okay, how much is God? Uh, uh, part of uh, the universe or how much do they overlap. Um, and if you take this tension very seriously, if you think, you know, once you em embrace deep dependence, you somehow have to give up on a full-blooded uh, transcendence, if that's, you know, the way you go. And you may even think, um, and I've argued that even if those uh, two views all by themselves, true transcendence and deep dependence are compatible, Compatible. You can hold both of those. Once you introduce a third view into the mix, which is that we creatures, some of us at least, have real freedom regarding uh, what we do. Once you introduce that, then there's no way to hold on to um, all three of these things. You can't think we're free and that we're completely separate and apart from uh, uh, the creator. And yet, our activities depend in this deep sort of way um, on the nature of the creator and, and his willing. And so if that's what you think. Yeah. Deep transcendence, uh, true transcendence, and robust, robust, a uh, creature, exactly. maybe libertarian, free, free will, as we talk about. Uh, could any two of those exist um, it, uh, by themselves? It's just when you get all three together, you have a logical contradiction. Is that your claim? My claim is that that's what I'm most certain of. Uh, I think even if you just had the first two I mentioned, the true transcendence and deep dependence, I think you're already in very hot water. Maybe in such hot water uh, that you should figure out before you even get uh, to talking about freedom, which one you really want to hold on to. You know, this is the tension that probably led Spinoza, uh, at least in part, to, uh, to embrace uh, uh, his, his denial of true transcendence. It was, uh, in part, his conviction uh, in, in the direction of deep dependence that led him uh, to, uh, to, to say, no, God is not uh, transcendent. In, in Spinoza's case, uh, he was led to 
the pantheism, that God and, and nature are one. But yeah, I do think you're going to have to go, um, you, you're not going to have to go to Spinoza, but you're going to have to go uh, a little bit in that direction. Um, and there are a number of ways to go in that direction. So I'll just, um, uh, yeah, highlight um, one of them, unless you want to yeah, go ahead. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, one way I think you can you can do that, and this is the way um, I've suggested in a number of papers, is that if you think that God and the universe are not uh, identical, but God is literally part of every single piece of the universe. Okay. And it follows from this that God, all by Himself, makes up every single part of the universe. Okay. He composes uh, every single thing uh, there is. OK, um, this is, uh, you know, um, it's kind of like uh, God is the analog of the null set for set theory. And no, the null set is a subset of every set. So God is what's called the null individual. OK, he is a part of every uh, concrete thing. Um, and I think in, in addition to sort of, yeah. The fine difference between that and deep dependence. But I want to leave the tension. I don't. Sure. Tension is good in philosophy, so let's leave that tension and let's go on. I, I want to explore okay. the relationship between metaphysics and theism. Uh, what are the kinds of metaphysical claims that um, make a classical God, as we, we've understood it, more or less likely? How can metaphysics help distinguish among diverse views of the nature of God? And, and more fundamentally, in thinking about God, there are the deeper questions about what exists, in other, in other words, and this is a great closer to true theme of, of leitmotif that we've had, what are the most basic non-reducible categories of existence? Okay, yeah, so uh, I think theism itself to be a, uh, a metaphysical view, at least in part, uh, it's a metaphysical view. Um, so of course it bears uh, on itself. Um, but if the question is about uh, other metaphysical views, uh, so the first thing I'd say is that I think it, in general, um, metaphysical issues are thoroughly uh, interconnected with one another. And especially when it comes to theism, theism is like a central node. Um, the, the question of whether theism is true uh, connects up with uh, so many other um, metaphysical issues, even if only uh, indirectly. But if we're looking at like broad uh, scale, um, metaphysical views that bear directly on theism, I think maybe it's easiest to start by thinking of ones that would rule out theism. Um, so, for example, uh, if, you know, global materialism is true, or by that, um, I mean that everything is a material object. Okay? It's the view that uh, there's nothing immaterial, uh, or nothing um, non-physical. Well, then that would, it seem, uh, rule out theism, right? Because if God exists, he's not a physical thing. He's not a uh, material thing. So if global materialism is true, and that's a, uh, um, a popular metaphysical view, at least these days, um, well, then uh, theism is false. I guess that would, uh, that would rule out uh, theism. Another, uh, maybe less popular view, um, but uh, let's say views that deny uh, the existence of certain phenomena, like free will, just there's no free will at all. Maybe free will is impossible um, or even uh, a, a little less common that there's no such thing as causation at all. Nothing can cause anything. Nothing can bring anything uh, about. Well, these may be a little more controversially than what I said uh, regarding global materialism, but I take it these would also um, rule out theism, right? I mean, theism, uh, the sort of classical picture of God um, it certainly involves God as if having created, produced uh, the universe, like you said in your, uh, you, know, you asked uh, about that earlier. And then also that he did it freely and in some sense of freedom, whether it's weak or strong, robust or whatnot, um, God was free uh, in, in creating the universe. So, but if there can't be any such thing as freedom uh, and if there can't be any such thing as causation, that would rule out uh, theism too. Okay, so those are views about like kinds of things that there are, kinds of phenomena. And then uh, uh, sort of a last category I want to uh, call attention to um, is a category relating to how many things there are, how many things there are at the fundamental level. So if you take a view that says, say that there are no things, because that's a, a view that's out there in metaphysics uh, known as ontological 
nihilism, that there are no things at all, okay? I mean, you could point out there and, and you could say true stuff, okay? But um, there are no things, no uh, countable items. I take it that would rule out theism. And if you go for too many things, namely more than one, at least if you're talking about monotheism, and I'm, I'm thinking monotheism, um, if there's more than one fundamental thing, okay, at bottom, you know, the, these things are not uh, existing in virtue of something else, that would also be um, incompatible with theism. So if, if pluralism turned out to be true, where by that I mean that the fundamental level, there are a number of things, then that would rule out theism. So you contrast monism, one thing, with radical pluralism, as you've discussed it, arguing that there's no viable middle ground between them, no viable middle ground between monism and radical pluralism that sees the world as fundamentally and absolutely fragmented. So in that case, would monism, if, if you go with monism, would that lead you to theism? Okay, so... Um I have argued that. I have argued there's no middle ground between monism and a very radical uh, pluralism. And I guess then the question is, well, assuming we go the monist route, um, where does that get us vis-a-vis -vis 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 theism? So in relation to what I was just saying, because any of those other views rule out theism, okay, then it just sort of, it, it follows by um, certain standard views about evidence and, um, you know, what confirms what, that the denial of any of those views, the bare denial of any of those views actually provides some support for theism. So for example, if you, know, uh, if you think there's something immaterial, then that pro provides some support for uh, theism. Likewise, when it comes to monism, monism all by itself, because uh, it's the denial of um, the, the alternative which rules out uh, theism all by itself, uh, does confirm, does provide some support for theism. But if you want to go any further than that, not just some support, but actually get you um, pretty far along the way to theism, you have to endorse a specific version of monism, I think. Okay, because some versions of monism will actually be incompatible uh, with theism. Uh, so monism, okay, understood here as the view that there's just one fundamental thing, one fundamental concrete thing. Okay, well, what's that one thing? So on, I, I think the most popular uh, version of this, both throughout history and in the contemporary literature, it's the cosmos as, as a whole. The whole cosmos is that one thing upon which everything uh, depends, okay? And I don't think um, that's consistent with theism because uh, then you'd have to embrace uh, the view that God is just identical with the cosmos if, if you think that God is going to be uh, the one and only fundamental thing, and that's uh, pantheism, which um, I don't think is consistent with theism. But here's another alternative, I think, uh, which is also um, a version of monism. It's also a version of what's called priority monism, uh, that there's exactly one thing, that concrete thing, that's fundamental, but which I think is compatible with theism, and not just compatible, it actually implies a good deal of what theism says. Uh, and that's uh, the view that God is part and parcel of everything there is, okay? That God literally makes up everything there is. Just like I said, right, God um, is the null individual. So this, uh, this view that says uh, God composes uh, everything there is, um, that would also give you exactly one thing that's prior to or upon which everything depends, as long as things depend on their parts. Is that a panentheistic okay. view that God oh. is everything, but God transcends all, all, all other reality? Well, I guess it depends on how you use that term panentheism. It's a, it's a slippery term. Usually the way it's cashed out is sort of the inverse of this. And it says that everything is in God, right? Which sounds like God has parts. And that's a conclusion I don't, I want to avoid. So I don't think that everything is in God in that sense. I think that God is in everything. Okay. okay. And, and that view has uh, several interesting consequences for the nature of that thing. Okay. Just the view that there is this thing that makes up everything that, 
That thing is simple. That is, it has no parts. It's omnipresent. It's everywhere in some um, very robust sense. It's eternal because it exists at all times. It's one of a kind and everything depends on it. So that gets you pretty far uh, to the existence of God. So from that version of monism, I think you can get um, in some sense to, uh, to theism. Okay. Now, you also argue in some of your work for idealism, the view that all reality is in some sense mental, as you put it, thoroughly mental, mental through and through. Um, and so how is, does this idealism, which has its own philosophical history, of course, articulate with the, the view, your monistic view that leads to God? What are the arguments that you use? And in particular, how do you distinguish your, that idealism from panpsychisms, uh, from dualism, um, and, and so this, by promoting idealism, how does that articulate with the monistic approach that you have in arguing for theism? Okay, yeah. So I think it's, it's an alternative uh, version of, of the monistic idea, alternative version of this idea that there is one thing that's fundamental upon which everything depends. And now um, the, the suggestion is that I, I worked on with uh, Tyron Goldschmidt, um, that the dependence here is not a part whole relation. It's not that the, uh, the universe depends on God as a whole, depends on its parts, but more as a thought depends on its thinker, like the way that uh, Barclay uh, suggested. Um, I don't know if these are consistent. I'm not uh, fully sure. Um, they may be consistent, but if they're not, then they're two alternative ways um, of cashing out monism. So what? how are we thinking of idealism? Like you said, uh, we... we uh, cash it out is the view that uh, the world is mental through and through, okay, by which we mean that everything, everything concrete at least, everything in space and time is purely mental. All of its features, all of its properties are mental properties, okay, and that's stronger, um, different from uh, panpsychism, okay, which uh, I understand to be the view that every concrete thing is a mental thing, not necessarily purely mental, but every single thing has mental features. Okay, but that's consistent with it having some features that are not really mental, like maybe mass. Okay, maybe mass is not a mental uh, sort of feature, it has nothing to do with consciousness. It's a feature separate and apart, but still that little electron, uh, uh, you know, or, or what have you um, has a mass and it also has some, some consciousness, some, some mental now, features. Now, you would like and, and to argue that from idealism, if that's the way you go, that's one way to get to theism. But isn't it the case that most claims for idealism come up with a completely different fundamental reality, that fundamental reality is not a traditional classical God in the Judeo-Christian sense, but rather a cosmic consciousness or some uh, of some uh, primordial um, awareness that is actually not personal. This reflects, of course, many Eastern traditions. So isn't idealism in, in that sense a weaker claim to go to your desired theism? Uh, yeah, so I don't, um, I haven't argued that uh, idealism takes you to theism. Um, and I do think there are good uh, arguments in favor of idealism. Uh, you know, the one um, Tyron and I uh, discuss is an argument from the philosophy of mind, the idea being it solves uh, certain puzzles in, in the philosophy of mind. Uh, you know, physicalism is an unattractive view for certain reasons. Uh, a main competitor, property dualism, that there are mental features and physical features, neither of which are reducible to the other. That's also unattractive for certain reasons. Uh, and this is the last view standing. Um, so that's the argument for idealism. Now the question is, well, what, where does idealism get you, whether vis-a-vis uh, -vis theism or, uh, or monism? And you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Uh, I do think the most uh, natural and intuitive way of going, if you're an idealist, uh, is the way that Barclay went. Um, you know, the, the most natural way of accounting for the fact that the tree is still there when uh, none of us uh, are thinking about it. Um, if idealism is true and every property really is uh, uh, a mental property, everything is uh, mentalistic, um, is the, the, the most simple and natural 
practical way to uh, understand that is that there is some supreme mind um, that's thinking uh, that's thinking these things all the time. But yeah, that requires work, uh, more work than uh, than I've done um, to to sort of make that case fully. Okay, now we're going to deal with a uh, much simpler and easier question that is a major theme of closer to truth, and that is. Why is there something rather than nothing? The ultimate question, why is there anything at all? I, I put easy in quotes, of course. Now, you make an interesting claim that it's possible for something to be brought into existence by something that is non-actual. You don't say that it's nothing, not at all, but it's non-actual. And that further, uh, the world is made up of or made by nothing, as you may define it, and then you add more complexity because you say this nothing is also some kind of an infinite. So you, you have a lot of jumps there and I'm not quite following you along the way. Okay, yeah. So to fill in all the jumps would take, uh, would take quite a while, but just, just to be clear, like you said, this is an argument for the possibility of something. Um, and sort of when I get to the, uh, the end of my argument and I try to say, oh, we can, we can give a model for a certain Kabbalistic idea, an idea that we find in uh, medieval Jewish mysticism, but also um, uh, Christian mysticism, uh, that maybe the world um, was made by nothing in some very real sense, uh, and that that nothing is also infinite. Okay, this is like a triply puzzling um, idea, and, and uh, you might think it's obviously incoherent. So, uh, you know, one of the bonuses, as I view it, of the um, my suggestion is that it's not obviously incoherent, maybe not incoherent at all. Um, so the, the argument for the possibility of this sort of thing goes by way of um, what are called Benardete cases, named for uh, the, the work of Jose Benardete, the philosopher, um, uh, who was at Syracuse, um, who wrote a fantastic book in, in the 60s called Infinity, um, with just tons of fascinating and rich puzzles um, pertaining to the metaphysics uh, of infinity. And Here's one puzzle uh, very quickly. Um, you know, let, let's say you have someone who, who plans to travel a mile from point A uh, to point B, and there are an infinite number of gods who uh, collectively are going to prevent this person from going. And how are they going to do that? Well, one god, uh, his role is that if the guy makes it um, halfway to point B, then he's going to put up a wall. Okay. Another God, his, his job is that if the guy makes it a quarter of the way, he's going to throw up a wall, a wall that will prevent him going any further, and so on and so forth. You can see how this is going, and you can see why you need an infinite number uh, of these gods. But now, assuming that they're capable of, of pulling this off, and it doesn't seem like uh, there's anything incoherent about that suggestion, then the mere existence of these gods prevents the guy from making any progress at all. He can't even leave point A. It's as if there's some sort of invisible force field, uh, Benardete says. He's caused to just stop dead in his tracks, even though they didn't do anything. Right now, there are a lot of puzzles you might, uh, um, that this brings out. Um, but one is that you might think, well, this, this person was caused to do something, namely stop in his tracks, without there being anything that caused it. And that's, that's deeply puzzling. Okay, um, but some philosophers uh, like John Hawthorne and others have said, no, 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 um, you know, maybe the, it's, it's puzzling and fascinating, but we don't need to conclude anything so crazy as that because maybe the, the collection of the gods, they stopped him from, from moving. And even though they didn't change at all, even though they didn't act at all, right, maybe if a single individual god uh, didn't act, well, he couldn't have caused anything at all. But that doesn't mean that the fusion of them together can't act or can't cause anything, sorry, without changing. But now my, the, the crux of my argument is to take the case one step further. And that's to just envision a scenario in which there aren't any actual gods of this sort, but that there would be, okay? That there would be if this guy tried uh, to make progress. Okay, and you can then talk about not just a guy trying to make progress, but a guy being annihilated or a guy being created. Okay, and then you could have a case where a person is created, a thing is created, maybe a universe is created because of an infinite number of non-actual non gods 
who each of them individually would act in a certain way. So are you giving causal powers to the abstract concept of possibilities? Uh, so these would have to be, um, I mean, I don't know if they're uh, abstract according to certain conceptions of abstractness, but uh, I, I definitely would be giving causal powers to non-actual things, okay? But these non-actual things would be in the ordinary uh, way of using the term concrete, just as concrete as any of the actual things. They're just not actual, okay? They, uh, they don't actually exist. They merely possibly exist. That sounds of re residence of David Lewis, if I- if Yes, I... yes, it definitely does, yeah. So I think this is an alternative route to David Lewis's view um, uh, that uh, you, know, you don't have to presuppose his view. I do presuppose his view at the outset and sort of warm things up, but then I think you can give an alternative view, uh, alternative argument, sorry, for his view um, along these lines. Okay, you call yourself a metaphysical skeptic because you suggest that because of the interconnectedness of metaphysical systems, there are actually very, very few complete metaphysical systems that are truly viable. So how, how do you defend this position, number one? And number two is that if you are a metaphysical skeptic, how does that relate to your theism? Okay, yeah, those are uh, excellent questions, um, especially the latter one. Uh, so uh, the, um, well, it, you sort of can warm up to the idea when you actually start working through metaphysical problems one by one. So, I mean, it, it, I, didn't, I didn't come to this until after having um, tried to do metaphysics for quite some time. Um, and, you know, I think anyone who's been in the, uh, the, the business long enough, many have been in the business longer than I have, um, I think we'll, we'll concede that one problem leads you to another. You know, so the issue of, of free will is intimately tied up with the nature of lawhood, which is intimately tied up with the nature of uh, counterfactuals, which is intimately tied up with the nature of, of space and time. And you find yourself, if you try to take a position on any one of these things, having to then investigate um, uh, issue uh, after issue seemingly with, without end. Um, and you can, you can come up with more and more examples of such sequences, you know, once you start looking into uh, metaphysical issues. But then, you know, I wanna make a more uh, specific claim than just this more amorphous idea that metaphysical issues, one thing leads to another. Um, so uh, the, the, the more specific claim I wanna make is that if you think about sort of the uh, ocean, the landscape of possible comprehensive metaphysical systems. So think about each uh, point there, each drop in that ocean being a comprehensive medical metaphysical system. It answers every single question um, that could arise in metaphysics. I think that at the end of the day, there are uh, uh, the, the viable islands okay, in that ocean, the islands of views that are viable, comprehensive metaphysical systems, are indeed uh, few and far between, okay? By which I mean two things. One is that uh, if you take from these, uh, any two islands, you know, a, uh, um, a piece of sand and a piece of sand from another island, um, well, they, they will be very different, okay? They will be uh, uh, distant from one another in the sense that they're intuitively very different in the world views they present, you sort of can't, uh, uh, occupy um, both viewpoints at the same time. It's like duck rabbit almost. And they're, the, the, the virtues they have, let's say theoretical virtues, like being a very simple theory or being a very fruitful theory um, and whatnot, they're gonna be um, so diverse as to uh, it, it make it very, very difficult if not impossible for us to evaluate which is better on that, um, on that front. So they're very distant from one another. And on top of that, they sort of reach the nether reaches, okay, of the of the ocean in the sense that if you were to take a, a comprehensive system from each of the islands, there'd be no issue on which they, they all converge, okay? So there's not going to be any metaphysical question, uh, any metaphysical question. I'm not talking about a comprehensive one. I'm talking about just, you know, do we have free will? Um, are there any objects? Um, any metaphysical issue there there is, there's always gonna be some viable metaphysical system that's gonna take uh, um, one position on that and another viable metaphysical system that's gonna take um, another position. So, so what's the implication, given that's true, given it's true, I'm not saying yeah. it, right. what are the implications for your theism? 
Yeah, so so I do think that it has, on, on the face of it, skeptical implications. I think it makes it um, uh, not possible to, using ordinary means at least, know any metaphysical thesis, okay? Because you'd have to be able to rule out the truth of some um, grand metaphysical theory according to which that thesis is false, and you can't really rule that out, okay? Because it's distant from these other viable systems that you're going to have to be uh, weighing them again. But where does that uh, leave my theism? Um, well, uh, one thing to say is that uh, it, it's not clear that this is going to undermine sort of weaker epistemic statuses, okay? So it could be that we don't have knowledge of metaphysics, but maybe we can still reasonably believe uh, certain things, okay? That's um, one possibility to consider. Another possibility to consider is that we do need God's help um, and that revelation plays, uh, plays a role in allowing us to know um, some of these things. Because in my argument for skepticism, I certainly don't consider the possibility that uh, God just reveals the truth about these metaphysical uh, issues. Sort of the whole, the whole argument is conducted uh, setting aside any special uh, divine revelation. But if there is such a thing as divine revelation, um, that maybe could be also the salvation. Good. Well, well that makes sense. Uh, some may think that's a, a, a rationalization uh, for a divine revelation, uh, and I think you would concede that. But it also could be a, a reason why, why it exists. So we'll leave it there. In fact, that's a good transition point. I said we wanted to get into your thoughts on Jewish philosophy in particular. So let's, let's begin. Um, and how would you define Jewish philosophy? I mean, I was brought up Jewish and I, I don't know. And I love philosophy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't really know anyone who really knows how to define uh, Jewish philosophy. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, if the question is what's Jewish philosophy, at least um, how, I'm, how I think of it that's as a conceptual question, you know, I'm, I'm pretty liberal uh, in that respect. It seems to me that any philosophical engagement um, with, with anything Jewish, whether it's a Jewish text, the Jewish theme, uh, a piece of Jewish history or culture or even cuisine, um, you know, what counts as Jewish philosophy. You know, I don't see why you couldn't, uh, or why philosophy about matzah balls uh, wouldn't be Jewish philosophy. It might, might, might not be very interesting, um, and it might not be the best use of our time as Jewish philosophers, uh, but it seems to me um, if it's done well, that would count as Jewish philosophy. But okay. there's a, maybe a more interesting question, which is what is the task of, of a Jewish philosopher, um, you know, what, what ought a Jewish philosopher to do uh, or to investigate? Um, and, and that, it seems to me, I can give a narrower uh, answer to, not, you know, something so liberal and, and maybe uh, annoying. Um, and that's, you know, when it, when it comes to uh, Judaism, as opposed to, let's say, Christianity and a number of other uh, religions, Judaism isn't really a creedal religion, right? It's not... Um, defined by uh, some sort of uh, creed, some sort of specific, very highly specific and crystallized set of propositions that, you know, you have to believe um, in order to be considered an adherent to that, uh, of that religion. So unlike when it comes to, let's say, Christian philosophy, where uh, a lot of uh, very interesting work is done on sort of um, defending uh, the plausibility um, or at least the coherence of certain uh, um, aspects of the of the Christian the incarnation or the truth. Exactly. Yeah. Are. So a ton a ton of interesting philosophical work is done to just investigate. You know, is the is the Trinity even um, coherent, um, and so on. I don't think that's really the task of the Jewish philosopher because there aren't these um, crystallized doctrines that you'd have to defend uh, in the first place. But the task in in is is really to take sort of, I think, what, uh, what the verse in Deuteronomy says, you know, what is uh, God demand uh, of you, but to, to fear the Lord and walk in his ways and, and love God uh, and to uh, serve him with all, your, uh, with all your heart and soul. So that's the crux of Judaism. That's what, that's what God is demanding of the Jewish people and maybe of, of humanity at large. And the role of the philosopher, as I see it, is to sort of unpack that, that is to, to investigate what are the commitments that lie behind that? And what are you committed to in virtue of that being something 
uh, that a person has to do? When what does the conception of God have to be? What does the conception of humanity have to be um, such that that's a sensible thing um, to, uh, to demand and, and a, uh, a sensible way to live life? Okay, now, and so the task, yeah. in, in, uh, in, in reflecting on Jewish philosophy, I mean, I like, and on Closer to Truth, we, we, fo we focused on, uh, if there's a God, what are the traits of God? What are God's actions? And there's so many interesting questions, but those questions, at least in the West, have been developed uh, mostly in Christianity from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance in the last uh, several decades. It's been dealt with in Islam. Uh, but much less so in Judaism, even, even today. There are less Jewish, uh, 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 there are Jewish philosophers, but many of them are materialistic, atheistic. Right, um, right, right. But, but uh, th th there is that distinction that, that Judaism traditionally, with, with all its um, intellectual focus, has not dealt with these kinds of questions of, of the nature of God. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Uh, and certainly if you're talking about um, uh, these days, um, if you go back in history, uh, I don't know if that's if that's quite true. I mean, you certainly have medieval Jewish philosophers uh, who, are, who are much less reticent um, and do venture into that kind of territory. And if you're willing to go beyond philosophers uh, and, you know, just think about uh, Jewish thinkers um, outside of the philosophical stream, you certainly have lots of reflection, um, much of it influenced by philosophy, um, but still not sort of philosophically rigorous, but much reflection uh, on the nature of God, okay, in, in the Kabbalistic world, in the later uh, Hasidic uh, uh, sort of world of thinkers, you definitely have um, lots of reflection uh, on that. But I think you're right that to some extent, um, uh, there's sort of a broader trend, which is a, a trend of, of reticence. Maybe uh, I put a more positive spin on it. Um, maybe the spin Maimonides uh, would put on it a sort of epistemic humility. Um, when it comes to these uh, sorts of questions, maybe we really, we really are uh, beyond our depth. You know, um, uh, you know that could be for a, a, a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, one of them may have to do with what you we were talking about before. Uh, you know, all of these questions being so interconnected, uh, it's very hard for us to find our way um, in the metaphysical ocean. But of course, beyond that, I mean, God uh, as a being who um, is in at least many ways transcendent. I mean, even if he fills the cosmos, um, like the uh, uh, Judah Halevi said, you know, where Lord will I find you? In a, in a beautiful poem, your place is uh, high and obscured uh, and where won't I find you? Your glory fills the world. So he recognizes, you know, e even the God's glory fills the world. Um, God's place is high and obscure. God is in, in many ways hidden and, and beyond us. So, you know, there's certain humility, I think. Ha have there been arguments in uh, the, in, Judaism's history for and against the existence of God, because we find that very much so in the, in the Christian traditions that the need to provide arguments. I, I don't find that in my limited knowledge of, uh, of, of Jewish history. Uh, yeah, so in, in medieval um, Jewish philosophy, you do have um, some engagement with that question, some serious engagement, uh, starting with Saadia Gaon, um, and and forward, um, uh, I mean, maybe Monides, Maimonides, who's the best known uh, uh, Jewish philosopher, um, his work um, is, uh, you know, notoriously difficult to interpret. Um, and as I was just uh, suggesting, has certain skeptical elements to it. So you don't get these the sense from Maimonides, who might be known uh, best um, and take the representative of the tradition that sort of, uh, you know, Jewish philosophy is all gung-ho about um, uh, arguments for God's existence. That being said, Maimonides himself does put forward arguments, both in his halachic work and in the guide uh, of the complex. And, and many other medieval Jewish philosophers were, uh, were less hesitant and maybe less uh, skeptical. Um, and uh, they, they did think that you could give um, arguments, for the most part, they were sort of, uh, cosmological arguments um, of one of one sort or another. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think that tradition maybe sort of died 
died down or, or, or faded um, for quite some time. Okay, but you know now we're we're experiencing a renaissance with analytic uh, philosophy of religion. Oh, good, good that you're you're in that uh, in that world. So I applaud that. Now, <clears throat> now the Jewish God, I'd like to compare with the classical uh, uh, God from from Christianity. And in the classical sense, the uh, God is uh, timeless, outside of time, uh, unchanging, uh, no events in, in, in uh, God's life, uh, simplicity, no parts, and uh, impassable. Nothing can affect God. Now, that's the traditional classical God of Christianity. Now, the Jewish God, and I don't want to be blasphemous, but can be convinced uh, you can bargain with the Jewish God. <clears throat> you can certainly struggle with the Jewish God. You can complain. Uh, and the Jewish God changes its own mind based on human interaction. I mean, I can't think of a more divergent concept of God um, than that kind of Jewish God with the classical Christian God. Yeah, so... Uh... I could just leave it at that and say, yeah, and then there would be a divergent uh, conception. But I don't think it's as divergent as it's often um, depicted. Uh, so you're right. You know, there are plenty of times in the Hebrew Bible in which it does seem like you find God changing his mind. And that that aspect, um, you know, uh, persists through rabbinic literature, uh, Talmudic literature. Uh, you know, you find God personified very, very um, clearly. Uh, and, you know, made to be the kind of being who's very much in time, very much changes, and certainly not uh, impassable. But first of all, I think it's important to note that uh, even within the Hebrew Bible, uh, that's not sort of the only view that you get. It's not the only picture that you get. So God is depicted in a lot of roles. That's sort of a, a, a you know, an important point to keep in mind about the Hebrew Bible. It doesn't give you a uh, list of propositions usually about God. It sort of depicts God in different ways and playing different roles. Um, and it also describes God uh, in different ways. So, you know, the verse in uh, Malachi uh, says, for I am the Lord, or for I, the Lord, change not. Uh, or, uh, you know, the, the verse in, in Samuel uh, 1.15 says, that says the, the glory of Israel uh, does not change his mind, for, for he is not a man. Um, right, so you do have uh, within the Hebrew Bible, it seems, um, uh, a variety of, of conceptions, or maybe um, this tension uh, is brought to the fore right there. And of course, we also shouldn't reduce Judaism or the Jewish God just to what you have in the Hebrew Bible um, or even in the rabbinic tradition. I mean, if you take account, if you take into account um, later developments such as the Kabbalah and medieval Jewish rationalism, who despite they're very, very different um, views about lots of things. They converged on this uh, view uh, of God as being utterly transcendent in the, sep in the sense of being um, conceptually transcendent. He's, he's beyond our concepts. Um, you know, a view that Maimonides held and, and many of the Kabbalists uh, held. And he's certainly not personal in the sort of way, you know, that a person would, would change uh, his mind. Okay, and so I think you have to take all of these together, and then maybe the, the picture that emerges is the more complex one. That you know, in some sense, God in Himself is unchanging, but as He relates to us, uh, is is changing. Okay. Some we, like to, we like to hold in our mind these contradicting views, and maybe yeah. that that gets us closer. So finally, uh, is the God of Judaism the same God from a Judaic point of view of other religions? And that's the question of universalism versus particularism. Yeah, so, I mean, since I think there's just one God, uh, if there would be um, another being, then it, it wouldn't be God. But I, I suppose the question is something like, um, do uh, other religions right. worship uh, the, the God that um, I take myself to be worshiping and, and other Jews be worshiping? And there I think, I think the answer is unequivocally yes, um, you know, at least with respect to a good number uh, of other religions. Um, you know, I mean, some religions might worship things that by our lights are clearly not God. You know, um, they are uh, created things. But certain religions uh, certainly do uh, worship the same God. And, and I'm attracted to a, a stronger view than that. Um, you know, that maybe the, the more interesting question even is, 
is there a sort of a, a legitimacy from a Jewish perspective to the particular practices and religions as vehicles and, and ways of approaching um, God? And, and there, I'm I'm uh, uh, very much attracted to the view of the uh, recently uh, deceased uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, um, who most emphatically uh, endorsed the position that yes, uh, there is a legitimacy, a very uh, real legitimacy to many paths to uh, to to God within the Jewish, the Jewish tradition. Those paths are not for Jews um, or for the Jewish people. God has given the Jewish people um, a certain way of life that uh, is the one that they are supposed to follow. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't expect and maybe even call in one way or another, upon other peoples uh, and other individuals even uh, to uh, to serve God in other ways. Um, and so that, that view actually, you know, has had very few explicit adherents uh, throughout the history of, of Judaism, with the notable exception of a the Yemenite scholar from the 11th century, Nathaniel, Nathaniel Al-Fayumi, he seemed to say that. Um, but he's a, he was sort of alone in that. But I mean, I, I think it, there's nothing uh, about um, the Jewish tradition, sort of central to the Jewish tradition, that uh, makes any serious trouble for that view. And it, it seems to me to be um, correct. And so uh, I'm uh, I'm on board with that view that Rabbi Sachs uh, put forward. Great, Aaron. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I love keeping these contradictory ideas in mind. I do think that gets us closer to truth about, about God in some sense. Um, we look forward to your continuing work, and hopefully we can speak again. Thank you so, so much for having me. I really appreciate it.